Some said this is how flamingo actually stands. So let's go back to this question. If there are controllable and uncontrollable states, then if the uncontrollable states after the analysis turns out to be stable, then that's still a good message to us, right? Those things that are, that are not controllable uh, will be stable by themselves, then uh, it's a good thing. So let's take a look at this example just to see some structures that we should be looking after. So let's say uh, two examples. The first is A, B looks like this. So X1, K plus 1 in discrete time is X1, K plus U, K, and then X2 doesn't depend on the uh, input, neither does it depend on X1 or X2. So it just stays there. So we can see that the input only can control x1. x2 is uncontrollable, right? We can get this conclusion by uh, noticing these guys over here. So x2 is uncontrollable because of these structured zeros over here. Now if we take a look at uh, this one, all right, it's a little bit more complicated. So x1 depends again on x1, the previous x1 and x2 and u, and then the x2 depends only, because of 1 here, depends only on its previous state. Doesn't depend on input. Looking at the physics here, u can only impact x1, and then u, there's nothing u can do to impact x2. All right? So, uh, we can see x2 is also uncontrollable here. x1 is controllable. So x1 is controllable, x2 uncontrollable in both examples. And then, again, the uncontrollable state for x2 is because of this zero here. And then also, it's because, so for this case, it's easy to see. For this case, it's also because x2 doesn't depend on x1, so this zero also makes an impact. So pay a little attention to this structure and how the zeros matter in terms of deciding the controllability. So we're going to go from these guys to the general case. How can we compute? Like first, how can we decide like how big are these subspaces? What are the dimensions? And then how to separate these subspaces. So let's do some regular assumptions. Let's assume for the general case that we're considering, we're doing a n by n A matrix. So it's a n-dimensional system. So because it's uncontrollable, so let's say the controllability matrix has a rank of uh, n1 that's less than n. Let's try to figure out the controllable part first. All right. Let's go back to revisit like uh, how we derived controllability. We derived controllability by noticing that uh, if we write out the state solutions to x, right, x is nothing but a combination of the free response, right, plus the forced response. The input impacts x n uh, by preceding this u vector by the p controllability matrix. If this is p is full rank, then uh, we can we can go anywhere. If this is spanning uh, Rn, then we can go anywhere from x0 to xn. If it's not full rank, then what we can best do, so we can choose the input, right? This is our variable that we can design. 
So the best thing that we can arrive, because this is not full rank, is whatever the range space of this P matrix give us. All right, the, the uh, best we can do in terms of controllability is if we call this like a subspace. If we call the controllable subspace as the set of all the vectors that can be reached from the origin. So let's say we picked a starting point already, and then the controllable subspace is wherever I can go by my input. The controllable subspace is from this analysis is the range space of the controllability matrix P, D. All right? That's the first rec recognize, recognition that we can make. OK? So let's, take a, let's, let's go to the observable subspace and see how, what will be the observable states using the same analysis. Let's start with some examples again. Recall, in the controllable ability example, we use this. This is the A matrix. This is the B matrix in the previous example. So let's take a look at uh, the observable case. My example to you is, let's say, x1, k plus 1 equal to x1, k plus uk, and then x2, k plus 1, is x1, k plus x2, k. And I can only see x1 from my output. So obviously, x1 is observable, right? And then x2, uh, we won't be able to figure out where the initial condition is. Because you can see, you can see here the dynamics. So x two k plus one depends. Even if we can see some part of it, there's no way we can know where, like the past comes from. So this x two k is doesn't appear in y at all. This case, the unobservable system comes from. You can see uh, here, right? This zero is important it gives us that x2 is not viewable from y. And then this 0 also is important. This 0 gives us the fact that x1 doesn't depend on x2 at all. If you can see x1, right, you won't be able to see anything about x2. In the observability case, these two zeros matters. So in the controllability case, these two zeros matter. All right. Once you recognize that, it's going to be pretty uh, straightforward to go to the general case. So let's take a break and come back to that. Take a look at something that's pretty cool. Some said this is how Flamingo actually stands, because they have this mechanism running. <laughs> All right, so I think uh, this is one of the most classic example. This is not as classic. This is pretty cool. Uh, inverted pendulum is a very classic example to demonstrate control, what control can do. Right? So in this case, this is what control can do. And then he does later, right? Control can, can make the system to be robust to disturbances that look like this, right? So you add a weight somewhere, and then it's going to balance itself. And then if you remove it later, it's going to be able to uh, stay stable. All right? <laughs> so that's pretty cool. And uh, this is another demo, triple pendulum case. 
So this is pretty standard. And then if you look, take a look at the impact of controls, so if you don't have control, you let it swing down. This is what happens. You, we talked about this is a chaotic system, right? So control can actually control chaotic system in the sense that if you have controlled applications acting on the joint, no, not joints, control is only acting here. So uh, is this still, right? So this is uncontrolled swing down. And then the controlled swing down, right? So which is pretty amazing. All right, so I don't have this physically to demo to you guys, but uh, I am planning to do a build in my lab uh, about this system and then about uh, something that looks like this. So if you guys want to participate, uh, I would be more than welcome to work with you guys on a pretty cool demo. So what I want to do is this. I want to, I did this in class, right? I did this in class. And I have a very pretty cool robot. I'm going to do inverted pendulum for this robot. So right now, the robot can solve a Rubik's Cube. We have one hand, two hands acting together to, you can see the manipulation later. So we have the algorithm to solve the cube within 20 steps. And then we are using cameras uh, to sense what's the color on each face and then uh, figure out the procedures to, to solve it in the end. So I want to do inverted pendulum using the vision cameras to, to do the, now this is three dimensional. We have three dimensional controls of the position at the end of the pendulum. So I'm not there yet, but what I can show you today is I coded a inverted pendulum uh, MATLAB script, right? To demonstrate to you uh, how control is important. So I have some regular parameters like uh, moment of inertia, these kind of things, based on the, the notes that I already provided to you on Canvas. So uh, I built the model linearized model. And then this is what we related to what we have been discussing, the controllability. So I constructed the controllability matrix, and then I checked the rank of the matrix. So the rank is four, so it's controllable at the equilibrium point. Now, if I don't have controls, I just let the system to run like a from some non-zero initial condition, I'm putting one, 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 one. So this is the initial angle. This is the angle we lost it initially. This is the <coughs> position of the cart. And then this is the velocity initially. So if I just let it run, then this is what you can get. Uh, you don't have to worry about the fonts. There's the more fonts. But what is important is it goes to, it, it goes crazy, all right? So. Uh, it's, it keeps rotating. Uh, if there's no friction, then it's going to keep rotating. And then the angle keeps increasing, increasing. So you see, once we understand the system, just one line of code, I can make the system, I can design a controller, and then make the uh, system to go all to the equilibrium point, zero, 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 zero. All right? We're going to talk about this controller next week. Just one line, then you can do the control. Now, let's uh, come back to how we can separate the, so switching gears a little bit, coming back to the case about separating observable and unobservable subspaces. The assumptions are here. The unobservable system, if we take a look at the, the rank of the observability matrix, is not full rank. Let's say it's n2 less than n. By what, what we mean by unobservable means those initial conditions, right? Uh, the unobservable subspace, let's say uh, chi unobservable, is the set of the non-zero initial conditions. 
that uh, produce a zero free response. So if I take a look at the measurement, it gives me zero. After it goes through the system dynamics, and it gives non-zero initial condition gives me zero output, then there's no way I can recover it, right? So the, from, from this, uh, what we discussed, so pay attention to what we are looking at here. So non-zero initial condition, and then free response. That means we don't have input, right? We're only taking a look at uh, xk plus 1 is axk, and yk is ck, cxk. This is what we're looking at, no input. So we wa just want to see the initial condition from the output. y0 is c times x0, y1 is cax0, right? So xk is akx0. So we can write out all the y output. Which equals C times A A K times X zero. All right. So the unobservable subspace by definition is the null space of Q. Right? Anything, any vector here that that lies in the null space of this observability matrix is going to give me zero output, right? So that's the recognition. What makes the system unobservable is when this looks rank, loses rank, not full rank, then it's going to have a null space that's non-zero. All right. So those are the concepts. When is a uh, system unobservable and how the unobservability arises? So now let's take a look at how we can separate these spaces. Let's start from the controllable, uncontrollable case. Uh, set up the problem first, similarity transform. So what we want to do, what we want to arrive in the end is we want to be able to see if you give me a uncontrollable system, I can transform the system's dynamics into a special structure where I can immediately see the controllable part and uncontrollable part. All right, that's the goal. So in the demo example, two by two case, we showed this. We see that X2 is uncontrollable because of the zero here. Right? X2 doesn't impact by U directly at all. U also can change X1 freely, but X1 doesn't impact X2 either. Right? So X1 doesn't impact X2, U doesn't impact X2. That's why it's unobservable. Generalizing, you can convince yourself that this is going to produce something that's similar to here. If I have, uh, I separated the uh, states by xc, which denotes the controllable part and the uncontrollable part. If after the similarity transform, the new A matrix looks like this and new B matrix looks like that, then you can see. You can see that uh, xc will depend on xck, which is fine, depends on xuck, which is fine, it depends on UK, right? So you can directly impact XC, all right? UK does not impact XUC, so this is zero here. And then although you can impact XC, XC, you can see this zero here, tells us that XC doesn't impact XUC. Everything that you can control doesn't impact this uncontrollable part. That's the structure that we're going to arrive. Okay? What I want to show you next is what is this matrix M? That's going to give me this uh, decoupled structure for uncontrollable system. So if you get the idea, then it's very similar to how we did, uh, how we did, uh, we talked about if I want to transform a controllable system into controllable canonical form, how we did that, right? There's an iterative step. 
uh, the situation is very similar to here. Once we know what we want to achieve, then the procedure is easy. <coughs> Let me give you the, the main result first, and then we're going to talk about uh, the details. So the main result is that it turns out there is a way to construct M systematically. So it's constructed by this. We have, remember, that uh, the controllability matrix is key. The range space of the controllability matrix gives us what is controllable. If the rank of P is N1, then the procedure let us do this. Pick N1 linearly independent columns from P. This gives us uh, the first part of this matrix, the similarity transform matrix. We want M, right? The core idea of similarity transform is that this matrix must be invertible, must be full rank. We're not there yet. We are just the M, M1 rank. So uh, pick the remaining columns such that the remaining columns makes this matrix to be full rank. All right? You can pick any linearly independent columns to make this non-singular. Then the result is that do this similarity transform. You get this beautiful separation of controllable part and uncontrollable part. All right? Controllability matrix is key, and uh, uh, the rank, the, the first part of the M matrix is completely defined from the controllability matrix. Let's talk about how we can, why, why this makes sense. Why choosing this two parts in this way we will be guaranteed to have the result. So I'm going to start from the B matrix first. B matrix, uh, from similarity transform, this is how it's related. Similarity transform gives us this uh, B tilde matrix is M inverse times B. So let's take a look at, uh, I want to show you that this actually makes sense. Let's take a look at the definition of P matrix. B, A, B, etc. All right. So we talked about the key concept that uh, the range space of P matrix, it actually defines the controllable part of the state. So if you see this, right, P contains B immediately, right? In other words, P, B, the vector, is in the column space of the P matrix. So uh, B in the, the column space of the uh, P matrix, right? So I can write it as B is in the range space of P. Now, the column space or the range space is entirely spanned by all the linearly independent vectors, columns of the P matrix. So we define MC, the first part of the, P, uh, of the M matrix, by picking all those linearly independent columns from P, right? B, therefore, because the construction of MC, B must be in the range space of MC. All right? So once you recognize that, then uh, you can see that this must happen some way. B, because B is in the range space of MC, B must be able to be written in some way that, like this. B must be MC times some non-zero vectors, right? I don't, I don't need to specify what it is, but it must be able to be expressed by MC times some vector, non-zero. So that's the first piece. Now the second piece is related to how we constructed the second part of the M matrix. We picked the second part by adding columns, right? We want to make M to be invertible. So we added the columns, we added columns here such that these columns are all linearly independent from the columns of MC, right? 
if this is contain any linearly dependent column of this, m is going to be non, it's going to be not invertible. So, columns of m, u, c, and m, c they are linearly independent. All right, because b is entirely in the range space of m, c. So, b shouldn't depend on any columns of m, u, c at all, because this is entirely in a separate space, linearly independent from this. That is telling us that this must be zero. Otherwise, we, we cannot have a B that satisfies uh, in the range space of MC, and then in the meantime, uh, independent from any columns in MUC. Let's denote this unzero part as B use BC bar. Then we arrive at uh, B times M. Uh, B is M times this. So in other words, M inverse times B is this structured vector with a lot of zeros in the second half. Any questions? So that gives us like this part. Now we see that uh, uh, the construction of M actually gives us the nice structure of the similarity transform. This is what we want. All right. For the A matrix, actually, we get something that's also very nice. So I'm going to show you that after we define the, how M looks like, then this similarity transform immediately gives us a zero at the left bottom. All right, so this is what I want to show. There are two, two steps. So the first step is by looking at how MC is constructed. MC is constructed from the P matrix All right, MC is from columns of this P matrix. Now, this P matrix has a very special property. If you multiply A to P, if you take a look at AB, AP is A times B, A squared times B, all the way to the last element is a n times b. So a b, this is the same a b, this is the same a square b, and then the different, the new, the, the seemingly new element is a n times b, right? From Cayley Hamilton's theorem, right? A n is actually a linear combination of A, A squared, etc. right? So this element, although it looks new, this is actually nothing but uh, linear combinations of, the, uh, of, of these guys over here. OK? So this is the concept of A invariant. So it's a concept that uh, if you multiply the matrix by A, so if you do AP, then you can actually see that the columns, the columns of the, the, the result is actually, it remains in the range space of the matrix. So let me repeat uh, just a little bit more. This time I'll bring in MC. So MC is some columns. MC is a subset of P is all the linearly independent columns from P. And if you multiply, if you do A times MC, then it's going to be something like this. It's going to be some, some columns that will be looking like this. What we show, like this here, is that the result, right, all these vectors 
it actually remains. So all these vectors, because of the Halley, Halley uh, Hamilton theorem, these all are in the range space of P. So these are all in the range space of P. So, and then uh, the range space of P actually equals to the range space of MC, right? This is all the essential vectors, all the linearly independent vectors in P. We can see that this concept is uh, this matrix, if you do A times this matrix, the result, all the vectors in this matrix remains in the original space spanned by the vectors. So this is A invariant. Uh, we're going to use this immediately from here. The key that we need, I brought up this is when we do, when we, when we try to derive this result, we need to compute A times M. Let's take a look. So just uh, write things out again. So this is nothing but AM equals, again, M times this uh, structured matrix here. So let's write out M as uh, two parts. First part is the MC, second part is MUC. All right. The left hand side is A times MC, A times MUC. By the analysis, we know that this part, A times MC, is A invariant. So it should be in the range space. All the columns of this vector, of this matrix, must be in the range space of MC. All right? So that is the result here. All the vectors must be, if you're talking about the range space, right, is some linear combinations of the columns of MC. That's why this is times this. This gives us the linear combination of the columns. Is zero, it's going to be zero because these are linearly independent. So by definition, A, MC is only A invariant. We didn't talk about uh, like the MUC part. These vectors, they are all linearly independent from the columns of MC. A times MC, because it's in the range space of MC, it shouldn't contain anything that's linearly independent from the columns of these guys here. All right? That's why it must be zero over here. OK? For the second part, we don't have that kind of an analysis. We don't have that property. Second part is there's no guarantee like uh, we can get a bunch of zeros for these columns over here. OK. So the structure is the most important thing. The analysis uh, gives you, tells you why, which I think is important. So this is the common decomposition. Decomposing a controllable, uncontrollable system into two parts. The first part, controllable, and then the second part, uncontrollable. All right. Uh, we're gonna, I'm going to do two steps of analysis. First is to show you that uh, this is actually controllable after this decomposition. OK? We have done the similarity transform and arrive at this AC matrix. Let's show that this subsystem, AC, BC, is controllable. All right? And the remaining is not controllable. If I take a look at this subsystem, then this subsystem, the B is 0. So if I do like controllability matrix, the BUC is 0. So no matter how I do BUC bar, AUC bar, BUC bar, uh, et cetera, it's going to give me 0. So this part, definitely uncontrollable. Let's take a look at the first part. Um, let's take a look at the controllability matrix after the similarity transform, which equals, so it's just a 
B tilde matrix, B tilde matrix multi A times this, so is AC times BC here, and then zero times BC plus AUC times zero, so it's a bunch of zeros underneath, and then on the top is BC, AC, BC, etc. This is just writing out the controllability matrix after similarity transform. Okay, so what I want to show is that the subsystem created with ACBC is controllable. In other words, this part, right, this is the controllable matrix, controllability matrix for this subsystem that we created. So I want to show you that this matrix has full rank, has rank N1. The steps are actually pretty uh, straightforward as well. For this new controllability matrix for the subsystem, we can see that uh, similarity transform doesn't change the rank, right? So the rank of the P matrix should be the same before or after the similarity transform. Before the similarity transform, we said the rank is N1. After, it should also be N1. Let's take a look at here. What, can we see, what we can see is that, again, the first part is BCA to A N1 minus 1. All right? And then the remaining columns over here is A, C, N1, A, C, N1 plus 1, etc. Now, because of, again, the most important theorem for this section, Cayley-Hamilton theorem, this part, A, C, N1, right? This is actually for all the future, like if you increase this power, right? So these, because of Cayley, Hamilton theorem. These are all linear combinations, linearly dependent with these guys over here, right? So they are all linearly independent with these previous columns. These will not increase the rank at all. These columns are all linearly independent from columns here. So therefore, the rank of this P bar matrix should be equal to the rank of this matrix. All right? Because we talked about the rank of this matrix is N1, so the rank of P bar should be N1. The subsystem therefore is controllable. The controllability matrix has full N1 rank. So we show that uh, uh, by decomposition, this is controllable, this is uncontrollable. Um, so the other result that comes out of this is that by this decomposition, actually we can reduce the dimension of the transfer function. So this controllable part of the state space system actually includes everything that you will see in the transfer function. All right? If you just take a look at the transfer function, you will be able to see only the controllable part. The uncontrollable part is not going to impact the transfer function at all. All right? That's the concept. The computation is very uh, straightforward. I want to show that uh, if you do transfer function, compute, 
uh, C, ZI minus A matrix inverse B plus D. Then the uncontrollable part is going to end up, is going to go away in some of the computations here. All right? Let's take a look at the computations and then come back to the concept one more time later. Uh, inverse matrix looks like that. It's a uh, upper triangular matrix. So the inverse, we know like the diagonal matrix, the inverse is very easy. It's like that. And then upper triangular matrix, its inverse is also very easy. So the diagonal terms of the inverse is the straight inverse of the uh, taking inverse on these diagonal terms itself. You can check very quickly if I have, uh, let's do EFG. You can quickly check that its inverse is going to be, at least the diagonal elements, it's going to be something like this. So. I don't need to worry about this term yet. So you can see that this must be true because if you have these, you can get E E inverse, which is identity, plus F times zero. So this is identity here. And then for the this part here, you're gonna get zero times G, zero G times this column, so it's zero times whatever you have here plus identity. So convince yourself that this must be true. This inverse must be true here. And then uh, this must be 0 to make this a identity matrix. Once you see that, then when you do this computation, you will see that uh, when you multiply things out, when you multiply this times this, only the first column matters. So this computation gives you only the first column. And then the first column, because of the zero here, is only going to, uh, the result in the row vector here, only the first element only going to show up after this computation. So this is going to give you, there's a PC here. Only the controllable part is going to show up in the transfer function. So this tool, this concept is actually very really powerful. If you think about, if you do control design from this, just, just the transfer function, what you can only impact is the controllable part. The uncontrollable part doesn't show up at all in the transfer function. All right. Same thing for observable, unobservable systems. You're going to see something similar very soon. All right. Some quick summaries. Uh, the same thing. The construction of M apply exactly the same for <coughs> continuous time systems. We discussed discrete time systems for continuous time systems, exactly the same structure A and B, exact the same construction for M. So in practice, I will quickly go through one example. In practice, uh, usually, this is symbolic. In practice, uh, usually you should be a little bit careful about the dimensions. In practice, this is a matrix, this is a matrix, so this is also a matrix. So you should be very careful when looking at things such as this. This one, uh, this mechanical system is, if you do the procedure, this is not in a, uh, decomposed common uh, decomposition form, right? So you cannot see very quickly what is controllable, what is uncontrollable. After the procedure, this is what you get. So uh, I will make a quick comment of how to read this one. So what should be the uncontrollable part? What should be the controllable part in this case? I remind you the formula here.
the uncontrollable part should be corresponding to the zeros in both A and B. Looking at A is this part, and then looking at B, it should be this part. The dimensions of the zeros should be the same in here and in here. Be careful, the B, the BC here is not this vector. BC vector, the controllable part, this is BC. This is the separation between these two. All right, so that's the example. In practice, you, you may encounter, actually, uh, it's not surprising that in practice you will see uncontrollable systems. So there will be some components that you won't be able to control. All right? Uh, it's not the end of the world. The system is, if it's sta stabilizable, then it's still good. This is saying that if the uncontrollable part, if the uncontrollable modes are stable, if these ones, if the eigenvalues of this uncontrollable A matrix is on the left half plane or in the unit circle in the discrete time case, then the system is still stabilizable code. Okay? That's still uh, a good thing. If the uncontrollable part is unstable, then there's nothing, there's not much we can do, all right? This is, uh, for this real time case, all eigenvalues in the unit circle, that's what we call score. Just a little recap. All right, so let's take a look at the Observable case, same thing, same logic. Some similarity transform will be able to transform us from a general case, which is unclear where uh, the unobservable part is, to this structure. I want to spend some time on the structure of this uh, common form. Recall the example at the beginning. This system, we can observe x1 out of y. We cannot observe, so this zero uh, tells us we cannot observe x2. And uh, uh, because of the fact that uh, x1 doesn't depend on x2, because x1 is x1k plus u, uh, we can see x1, and there's nothing we can see about x2 in x1. This zero is therefore important. Now, in the general case, it's just uh, putting zeros in here and here. So, in the general common decomposition of unobservable systems, we have this kind of structure. You can be as crazy as you want in the bottom part, but in the top part, uh, the observable part, you can see nothing about the unobservable state in the observable part. All right. So the computation of U of the O matrix, the similarity transform matrix, is very much similar to how we constructed M in the controllable, uh, uncontrollable decomposition. Here, the key is the observable, observability matrix, Q. So this O is constructed of all the linearly independent rows of Q, adding some uh, rows to make the whole matrix to be invertible. Okay, so the theorem, the common canonical form decomposition, actually tells you that follow this 
you can obtain this decomposition. And then furthermore, actually, uh, the after the decomposition, the observable, the AO and OO is observable. And if you compute the transfer function, that's all you can see in the transfer function. You can only see only the observable states, observable dynamics impact the transfer function. All right? So, uh, the proof is this time we don't even need to go through all the steps that we went through. The proof is amazingly simple. By looking at, by comparing the observability case with the controllability case. In the controllability case, we showed this, right? We spent time figuring out that these two zeros actually arise naturally. In the observability case, is sitting here. Remember, uh, this looks very much similar, right? If you do transpose of this matrix, let's say here, if you do transpose of this matrix, you get a zero going to the top right. And you do transpose of this one, you get a zero to the right. All right? So exactly, this is how we're going to use. So we're going to use the duality between controllability and observability. Right? If AB is controllable, then A transpose, B transpose is observable. If AB is uncontrollable, then A transpose, B transpose is unobservable. So just do a transpose of these matrices, you're going to get this. And the, uh, this, the controllable part becomes the observable part because of the duality. All right. So the structure is important. The uh, the concept about the derivation, uh, as long as you get the main concept, I will be pretty happy. So similar to the uh, stabilizability case, right? If the unobservable part is unstable, then that's a bad thing, right? We have something that we don't see. But it's, uh, but it's unstable. So if the unobservable modes are stable, then we're still good. So we can see the, uh, it's called detectable. Okay? The unobservable modes are not harmful. All right? So, uh, this is again, in the discrete time case, it's skr. This AUO is skr. All the eigenvalues are inside the unit circle. All right. So, so it's one thing that uh, uh, a quick summary. So, we talked about the fact that uh, the only the controllable or the observable state dynamics go into the transfer function. The overall, you can see there is a reduction of order, right? The overall order of the system, the A matrix is N, and then after this computation in the transfer function, you don't see that. You can only see an N1 order transfer function. Some modes are lost. Uh, the message that I want you to take home is that when the, there will be reduction of order, this happens if some poles and zeros are the same. There are cancellations in this division between the numerator and denominator then we get reduction from n to n1. All right? So pole zero cancellation exists when we have uncontrollable system. OK? So same thing for observable case, observability case. So when you have uncontrollability or unobservability, that means 
in the transfer function analysis, some pole zero cancellation will happen. All right, that's for today. See you next week. <laughs>